I have a confession to make to you. I was an alien. I was classified as an alien, and my dark past was erased when I become a US citizen. Some of the aliens are among us. You should look around. They can look just like me. They can just look like that. And yes, we are invaded by the aliens. Yes, there is an invasion in the country by the aliens. Some of the other aliens will look like that. There are just any similarities. It's just mere coincidence. In the immigration law, we call immigrants aliens. We start with a very offensive term. I understand the alien definition in the English, alien. It is something foreign. Yes, I understand that. But why to call an immigrant that is an alien? The case in immigration is called the alien file. It is, doesn't have a case number as any other court. It is called the alien number. So I do have a dark past. Because even though that I'm US naturalized citizen, I have still my A number. And my A number is in my certificate of naturalization. I find that to a startup very offensive. So who is the men in black in the US? Who is taking care of the US and uh, saving us from all these aliens? that is, inv is invading our country. I hope that they can look as handsome as those two gentlemen before, and we can have a lot of fun with this, just the small guns, and, uh, and I hope that it was just a movie nowadays. So the men in black, the real men in black, we have to think about who is immigration. And we have the Department of Homeland Security. Everybody is familiar with that, correct? So within this department, we have three major sub agencies. And we have to actually know which agency is acting upon the alien to know what is happening in the case. To start off with, we have the borders, CBP, Customs and Border Patrol. As the name defines that, they are taking care of the borders. Then we have ICE, which is the police. ICE, it is the one, it's the agency that all immigrants fear about ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. This agency is the one that is arresting the immigrants and referring them to immigration court or deporting them from the US. And finally, we have UCIS or CIS, which is the Citizenship and Immigration Services. This agency gives the benefits within the US. So if you want to apply for a work permit, you have to go through this agency. If you're applying for a residency, you have to go through this agency. If you want to apply for naturalization, you go through this agency. So each of these three agencies, this, each one of the men in black, they have a very defined powers. And it's very important for you to know which one it is the one that is interacting with your client. Good afternoon, my name is Deifilia Diaz, and I'm an immigration attorney. I practice here in the US in Cincinnati, Ohio. I have my own practice. I have my office that is called Valencia and Diaz. I represent victims of crime, unaccompanied minors, and immigrants in the immigration court. Buenas tardes, my name is Serendira Lopez Garcia, and I was born and raised in Mexico. I came to the United States, I'm also an alien. I came to the United States uh, by marriage. I got married and I, I came here as an adult. And I um, studied here my doctoral degree and I graduated from the School of Professional Psychology at Rice State University. And I'm a licensed clinician and I also have my private practice. And then, um, we were wondering, um, since we were going to present this topic that is full with law terms and then immigration and a lot of things, uh, how many of you have been involved in writing a report for immigration courts? Oh, great. So, so, so I, I would like to have your input, and we would like to have this uh, presentation very conversational, so you can ask questions at any time, and also comment your experiences, because we are going to enrich from all of these experiences. Now, how many of you are familiar with the immigration kind of type of re uh, immigration relief that a person may have in the United States? 
Okay, so, so you are familiar with those, so the rest not. So we are going to pretend that you don't know and then you can add if you, uh, if you need to, but we need to go with the basics and explain a little bit what that means. And we are here to actually be responsible. You are advocates. I am an advocate in court. When I'm talking about my client, what is the suffering that they have or will have if they are deported? I'm an advocate when I'm trying to convince an immigration officer that my client deserves to stay here in the US. And you are too. So silence and cowardness, it will be a complicity right now. Can somebody from the audience read that poem for me? You, you have a smile. Read it for me. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. So what are we waiting for? There is nobody that is there to speak for us, to actually stand up and break the silence. Yes, it's difficult topics, but now is when we have to open our mouth and talk about this. If you don't know, learn about it. Because you are an accomplice, not knowing, not doing something, because today it is the time. We deserve a better country. Our children deserve a better country. This poem was not written for this precise moment in the history. It was written in the Holocaust. So a man that does not know the history, it is condemned to repeat it. What are we waiting for? So you have to ask, what is your responsibility? Every day I stand up and I fight to have a better country, a country that I thought that we have, and I have hopes that we will again build for this little guy that is my son. And for this big guy who is my son. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm here asking you, what is your responsibility? What is gonna move you today to speak and be the advocate that your clients needs you? So, um, how are we going to be involved in this? And I'm going to tell you the way that I got involved in this. I am a licensed psychologist. I see clients in my private practice. And the clients that I see are bilingual and a lot of Spanish-speaking clients. So uh, some of them are documented. Some of them do not have documents. So, I remember the first case I had, that was a while ago, when I was providing therapy for trauma, and this person was uh, held in the border and was kidnapped, and then later on, extremely, extremely abused by uh, the Zetas, it's a cartel, a drug cartel in Mexico. And the FBI uh, put him uh, over there in the group, so he, the, the person started reporting the names of whoever was doing the harm to him. So then he was released, and then he, they needed to prove that the trauma that he suffered was legitimate. So he, I was seeing this person in therapy, and then I get this letter from a lawyer saying, can you write down something? I'm like, what am I going to write? I didn't have any idea and I didn't have that much guidance. And then I start thinking, oh, so this is a field that is needed. I need to start getting, myself, um, start getting acquainted of what is going on to not do a desert to the client when I'm writing this letter uh, to, uh, to the lawyer who was going to present in court for immigration. Then later on, I start getting more and more um, knowledgeable, I met her, and then we start teaming together. She was guiding me in terms of the law. I was guiding her in terms of the psychological effects. And then we start working together uh, since a while, while ago, right? Seven years ago. Seven years ago. So then I realized that, uh, that 
what happens in court when they go to court or when an official is reading the report, they don't know that much what major depression is or they don't know what the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder means. So I start realizing that you have to write down the reports totally different of what I was, what I learned in school, totally different. That I needed to implement more information, and I'm going to be talking about what information I implement and everything. But, and then I start realizing that there were not many like us who do that work. I don't know what has been your experience, but when I have to refer them to another provider because of conflict of interest, I have to send them to Michigan, or I have to send them to Illinois, or because there is not that many providers, and I don't know if you know other people in, in Cincinnati, but, but people uh, who come and see me, little are from Dayton, most of them are around um, the state of Ohio. And um, so, so I start looking at that, and then I, I, am, um, I am a member of the National Latino Psychological Association, and we start talking about this, and then we start developing a list of providers in each state who, are, who have a specialty in, the, in, in doing these reports. And I was the one who was doing the list, and I find out like there were one, two in New York, you may think New York has a lot, right? One in Ohio. Uh, and then others, so then this talk has been going on in the national, in the NLPA to start training more uh, psychologists to do this type of work because it's emerging and it's, it's, it's coming. So, um, do you have the next? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that uh, when I get referrals that they, uh, they share with me, my colleagues, is that one of the obstacles for not uh, doing these reports is because they don't know the immigration law. So you really need to have a basic understanding. You don't need to know all, but you need to have a basic understanding. And they, they sometimes, uh, a person who comes from El Salvador, for instance, um, it's coming from not only the person, but all these layers that are surrounding this person. Uh, could be political uh, persecution, could be gang member activity, could be femicides. Uh, we were reading that Salvador is becoming one of the number one uh, countries that uh, murdered women um, in, in El Salvador. So uh, to understand the political context that the person is coming on, coming to be evaluated is very important. So, um, so it, this report uh, is different because we can talk about how the development of this person was affected by the community, by the system, by the politics, and by, by many layers that surround this individual, or by the immigration process that we are going to be talking about. So one of the things that this has been my experience is that, and I don't know people who have been doing reports, and I'm talking about Latin American people because that's my clientele, but of course uh, we have other people who are seeking this relief. So basically in South America, because of the distance, usually uh, my experience has been is that they come with a visa, tourist visa or a student visa, and sometimes they overstay, and then that's when they need uh, your services, overstay the permit. A lot of people come from Central America, and how do you call this triangle? David? The triangle of violence. The, uh -huh. um, yes, in the report, I love Arendera's report because they don't talk just about the diagnosis, they give a background, and they take in consideration what the immigrant it is bringing with him or her to the United States. And it's not only why they are fleeing, you know, why the reason that they arrived to the United States is also taking consideration what happened in the home country. It can be domestic violence, it can be involvement with the gang, or it can be persecution, whatever have you. But you have to ask about that because it will give a different context in the case. And you should speak with the attorneys. The attorneys should be there to guide you in the process of the report. And there's so many cases, so many reliefs when you are needed that you are not expecting. I'm not expecting the psychologist to know 
all the law and immigration. So don't fear about that. Talk to the attorney, and the attorney should be able to guide you on the requirements and the specific language that is needed in the report, because we will learn the difference in the language that it matters, because the officers will be expecting that precise language that is different from relief to relief. So here we have our, my clientele also is large from Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. So this triangle is called the triangle of violence because of the gangs, because of the feminicides, and uh, because of the violence that is occurring in that countries. So uh, next, when doing the evaluation, I usually ask for how long have they been in the country? And uh, how do they came to the country? Because there is going to be there, it's going to be, you're going to have an idea of the exposure of trauma. Sometimes the clients do not report that because at times they think it's normal. They normalize the experience when it is important to include in the report. Has anybody heard about the BEAST? Okay, so the BEAST is called to a train that comes from Guatemala and ends up close to Texas. And this is a cargo train that immigrants, you can see the immigrants, you can see the pictures over there. They go on the top of the train all the journey, all the journey to the United States. Some fail, die, some women have been raped. They are sometimes assault. So they encounter a lot of, uh, all, the, all the trip is it's a lot of, because they are exposed to the cold, the rain, they don't have that many clothes, they don't have food, they, they have to do all their physiological um, needs on top of the train. Sometimes they get out, there are some shelters in Mexico that they have start uh, building to provide them, uh, for them to bath, provide them food and things like that, so they get up, but then they have to get in. And when they get in, it's not because the train stops. They have to jump to the train while the train is running. So, and then um, one of the people who are very active, and I, we just put this uh, picture, these are the gang members of Mara Salvatrucha. Is anybody familiar with that? Yeah. So uh, the Mara Salvatrucha is a gang member that actually was originated in Los Angeles. So, uh, so it was originated in Los Angeles because they wanted to protect when, when the civil war in El Salvador was going, they start migrating to the United States, and there were other gangs, and they start forming them to protect uh, the people from El Salvador. But then deportation start happening, and they start being deported to El Salvador. And now they start forming one of the most, I mean, it's one of the biggest ones around not only the country, but they're even active in the United States. We have had cases of Mara Salvatrucha in Cincinnati, Ohio, right? So, uh, so they are active. And then they are characterized because they wear a lot of tattoos in their faces and in their bodies, and is recognized to be a very, very violent group. So, um, so one of the things is that uh, when I do my evaluations, I ask them how did they cross the border and if it was any accident of trauma or if they were exposed. Because sometimes, another thing that is happening now, they are being kidnapped at the border of Mexico by, um, there is a group in Mexico that is called Los Zetas, uh, and they are kidnapping them. And then they know that they have family or relatives in the United States. They get their phone number, and then you have you are nodding, right? They they get their phone number, and then they start storing and asking for money. We have had several cases of those as well. So that's very important for you to become acquainted that this is happening. Uh, Mar Salvatrucha is very prevalent here in the United States. So we have a lot of presence in Cincinnati, Ohio, and the FBI is already involved in those cases. So imagine a person that is fleeing uh, the persecution from this type of gang, and all of a sudden. They, they, they think that they came to a safe harbor, but it's not. They have learned that also Mara Salvatrucha has a presence here, presence here. And we do not, we have 
a difficulty understanding how that is happening. I'm a Mexican. I, I was born and raised in Mexico. I know how it is to be living in a country that has a lot of insecurity, that you have to take care of yourself when you go out. I know that. But when I'm, I'm getting acquainted with El Salvador and how people live in Salvador and my clients to tell me what is happening in Salvador, I have to try my hardest to understand how people actually live there and survive there. So my question is, if I am having that issue, what can I hope that for an immigration officer or a judge? That sometimes they haven't even traveled abroad the United States. So this is the level of the language that we have to be uh, in, having in our heads, that we have to explicitly mm -hmm. state it in the reports because that's the only way that they are gonna understand. And we cannot assume that they know or they should know because most likely they don't know. Everybody says, get in line, right? Why you cannot get in line to the immigration system? It is very easy, my ancestors did it. That's how we got a residency. That's how my family got papers. Get at the end on the, of the line. There is no queue. For some of immigrants, 11 undocumented immigrants in the United States, there is no line. And I think that there are more than 11, uh, than 11 million of undocumented immigrants. That is just an estimation. But why there is not a line? In 1997, we have the harshest law that came enacted in immigration law. That is before technology had a boom. So imagine how antiquated the immigration system is in our country. So in 1997, we came to the, with this law that created unlawful presence, that created undocumented entries, and also came with bars. And if somebody is not understanding me because of the language, just raise their hand and I will just explain it differently, please. I am trying to make myself the most understandable. Mm -hmm. uh, so when somebody entered to the country with no documents, they did not present themselves to an immigration officer saying, please let me in, I wanted to be admitted. And they just run, run and I hope that they, they are not gonna be catched or sneak it in. That is called undocumented. And the, the law defines that as entry without inspection. And this law defined that. And then came with harshest um, bars. So if that person entered to the country undocumented and stayed 180 days, that means six months, and leaves, at the moment that they leave, they have been triggered a three-year bar. If they stay more than a year and they leave, they acquire a 10-year bar. But if they trigger the 10-year bar, I came back in undocumented, they have the permanent bar. And some of my clients, they said, that happened 10 years ago and I'm here, I should be able to apply. No, 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 that doesn't work that way. You have to purge those three years, 10 years, or whatever is your sanction, outside of the United States. So these bars will come more evident later on in the presentation. But what I wanted to mention right here, it is the line. This famous line that doesn't exist, that I don't know who came up with that argument, but how you can be a resident, how can the United States can open their arms and say, welcome, here you have a residency. So it can be one of two ways, very easy, right? So you can be closely related to a US citizen or you have to be a highly skilled worker. And the close relationship to a US citizen, it doesn't mean that you have an aunt, you have a cousin. No, 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 the law doesn't define that. You have to be closely related to spouse, children, parents, or even a sisters, siblings. But that is not immediate, the immediate, Definition is just spouses, children, and parents. That's it. A highly skilled worker means that you went to college or have a higher degree. So what should we do with this 11 million undocumented people that do not have a college degree and do not, are, are not closely related to a US citizens? There is no line. There is no line, unfortunately. 
So how I see all these people that are not closely related to a US citizen and not, are not highly skilled workers are just commoners, okay? They don't have anything to do and that's why they are in the limbo. And I wanted to point it out because maybe that comes in the conversation that you can have after this beautiful conference because I get empowered when I go to, to conferences and now uh, you can have these conversations later on. Did you know that undocumented people pay taxes? And how do they pay taxes? Well, the IRS came up with a magic number that is called the IT number that looks like the same as a social security number. It has the same digits and they can pay their taxes. In fact, they do pay their taxes. So the IRS had an estimated on how much money undocumented immigrants are contributing to the United States. And the question becomes then, so why the IRS it is not providing all that information to DHS? Because the IRS says, oh no, there is billions of dollars here. There is no <laughs> way that I'm just gonna share with you this information. We are benefiting, but we like to be hypocrites, right? So this is one way. The other way, it is they live here, they buy goods, they are paying taxes. Other ways, and uh, people say, but they do work with a fake social security number and that they are using identities from other people. And I say, yeah, that's a crime. And I, I don't endorse that. I definitely do not endorse that. And I'm not pro illegal immigration or uh, undocumented immigration. We just have a problem and we need to solve it. And there is some misunderstanding about this. So how the social security works? For those that are receiving social security right now, it is not that they are getting what they paid for when they were working. It is that we that were working right now and contributing to the system, we are paying for the ones that they are retired right now. Do you understand that? Okay. So the undocumented immigrants that they're using fake social security numbers and they're paying the contribution, they're paying the US citizen or law for permanent residents or the people that have rightfully earned their social security benefits. And the undocumented immigrants are the ones that are contributing to the system for it not to crash. How many people know that the social security system, it is also broken and needs a reform? So they also have information and data on how much the undocumented people are contributing to the social security system. But we don't want to hear that, right? but we need to solve this. And one other thing is that um, they, the IRS give them a number so they can pay taxes, um, and, but in most of the states in the United States, they cannot get a driver's license. I think California is one that is allowed, and that there are other two states. Washington, Washington Illinois. Uh -huh, Illinois. But no, like for example, in Ohio, they drive without a license. So, um, yeah. yeah, and uh, going to this conversation, it is who is solving this prohibiting and harshest policies? Who does it serve? We are just cornering people to do, to commit crimes, and then they're gonna get a ticket, then they're gonna get into the immigration system. When, when they are working and they allow them to get a license, they're gonna be in the system. They're gonna get an insurance, they're gonna be in the system and you can track people this way. They're gonna be identified by, easily by police officers. I have a lot of conversation with police officers and they say the only thing that I care it is for them to tell me the truth. Who are you? Who are you? Because if I don't know who are you, my life is in danger. And if you don't present me a government ID, I'm, just, I'm gonna take you to the precinct for fingerprinting you. And if I take you to the prison to fingerprint you, then you are in the system and you are arrested. And if you are arrested and the policy of that police department, it is to call immigration on that immigrant, then that immigrant it is out of luck because it is already into the immigration system and most likely ICE will have put a hold on that immigrant. So let's not fool ourselves that we are not benefiting ourselves, neither the whole community with this. Immigrants, undocumented immigrants, also have fear to report crimes. Mm -hmm. If they don't report crimes, 
that suspect is at large and then can come and rob me, can rob my neighbor, can rob us. Again, it is just coming out of fear. <coughs> so where you fit in all this conversation, right? We are here for that. So because we have a system that do not allow commoners to get in line, we have the beautiful statute, right, in New York that said, come on everybody, I will protect you. Come into the free land. And the law said, well, yeah, we cannot be that harsh. Let's Underneath the rug, we can have humanitarian petitions and exceptions to the rule. And the humanita humanitarian petitions, it is when we need you. Exceptions to the rule, we need you. And that's where you come into place. The type of immigration relief available for humanitarian petitions. We are going to talk more in detail about this. We have U visas, victims of crime. We have T visas, trafficking, SIJS, a special immigrant juvenile status, which is for unaccompanied minors, minors that are traveling without parents. We have VAWA, Violence Against Women Act, cancellation of removal, asylum, and waivers for naturalizations. There is many things, many things that we can do and help people from here. And now the extreme hardship waivers. Is that it with in immigration? It's not, it is not. Uh, immigration attorneys, we specialize in just one practice because if we tend to do everything, uh, it, it, it will be too complicated. So this is just a list, it is an initiative um, of the non-immigrant visas. And that doesn't mean that an immigrant can arrive in this visa and then later on transfer to another visa. So we go through the whole alphabet. We talked about agencies, and if you write this report, if you're gonna be providing a testimony, an expert testimony, please ask the attorney, who is gonna be my audience? Who should I be directing the report? Who, what I can prepare for? Because it's not the same to be preparing a written report for an, from an officer that is just gonna read it. I suppose that you are gonna be in the stand in court and then you're gonna be cross-examined. Are you prepared to be cross-examined? Raise your hand, of course you are. <laughs> you are, don't fear it, because you know your stuff. You know it, better than anybody in that room, better than the attorney that is representing the immigrant. You know it. Don't let that courtroom fool you, you can do it. Okay, and this is the time where we need you, so you, it is no better time, and we will, you will do it. Sadly, the prosecutors are overworked, and they tend to do the things difficult. The prosecutors in immigration court, they are there not to deport people, but they, they should be there looking out for the enforcement of immigration law, but sometimes, they are not for that reason, so we have to remind them, okay? So talk to the attorney. Try to see and uh, investigate who is gonna be your audience. We talk about the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Justice, which is immigration court. Uh, a little bit, a lot, another note about the immigration court. We attorneys, we say that there is not a real court. It, it looks like a court but it's not a real court, why? Because it's an administrative court, okay? So what that is, think about when you are not getting your social security benefits. You appeal that and you decide that you want a hearing and that judge is gonna be an administrative proceeding. Or you get fired and you apply for unemployment benefits and they get denied. You appeal that and you want a hearing, that is administrative. So in immigration, we have the court that is an administrative court. If you don't like that decision, then you go to the Board of Immigration Appeals. If you don't like that, then you go to the federal court, a real court. And then the thing is start having, you start having fun and the things that start happening. And then if you don't like that decision, you go to the federal court. And if you don't like that decision, you go to the Supreme Court. 
And then I ask you, which immigrant will have that money to pay for attorney's fees? Does the state provide for an attorney? No. And sometimes the, immigrants, the immigrant is in detention, is in jail. They call it detention, but they're in jail. They are wearing same uniforms, not the color, the, the color code people, but they call it in civil detention. That is why the state should not provide or doesn't provide an attorney. But still, they are in jail. And last but not least, we have the Department of State, and that is the consulates and the, or the embassies. And your report will be re read by a consul when an immigrant is applying for a waiver, a hardship waiver. Uh, we will talk more about that, but I just wanted to mention. We also have to be very careful with our language. If you don't know the word, what the word means, do not use it or ask or search for it. How many people have heard that it is referred to undocumented as illegals? Wrong, wrong, don't do that, please don't do that. And correct people from doing that. Talking about offensive language from the beginning, aliens, illegal, that is diminishing the human being. We should not talk about that. So. An illegal person, it is defined by the law and you have to be an attorney to actually make that determination. Because being an illegal, be it having a, an illegal presence in the United States, it is actually trigger, triggering criminal consequences. When you enter without inspection, it's not. So there is this confusion. And the illegality of the entry, it is triggered when you trigger the permanent bar. Remember the permanent bar that I, I talked to you about? That is the illegal re-entry. And then, yes, you are referred to the marshals, and then they, you are referred to the federal prosecutor and see if they're gonna formalize charges against that immigrant. Most of the time they do not do that, unless you have a criminal background that is smuggling drugs, smuggling people, arms, and all of that, all of that. But the system, it is uh, heavily overloaded. And the undocumented, it is just the immigrant that came to the United States without paperwork. So please do not refer them as illegal, just be safe and just refer them as undocumented. So one of the things that I have found working with this population is that um, they are really target of criminal activity. And one of the things is that we put the check into cash slide because usually they cannot open accounts in the bank. There are only few banks in, in, in Ohio that allow, but how, do, how they are going to know which bank it is or what, which one. So they have cash. So when they are paid, they are paid with check and they have to go to these stores to cash their, sal their, their, their check and they have cash. And you know how they are called in the community? The ATM machines. So why? Because they wait for them outside, they know they have money, and then they rob. They're robbed. Or their homes. They know that they are keeping all their money over there because they cannot deposit that money in the bank. They are also very vulnerable population, really vulnerable. Very vulnerable for extortion. We have a case in Cincinnati of a police officer who was extorting, who was asking, was telling the clients, the, the, the individuals, they were saying, you know, if you give me money, I, I can get into the computer of the, uh, of the Homeland Security and put you as that you can have documents. So you are not, if you are stopped by a police officer, you are not going to be deported. Give me money, 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 until this guy, did it so much that it was it was uh, it was the day and it and he mm -hmm. was is in jail now, right? Or no, well, he was not story. in jail. Okay. So, but that was one police officer that I that I knew. Um, another another thing that sometimes is that because there is a need that I would like to be here and have papers and, and be able <coughs> to work and drive without 
the fear of being detained by a police officer. Then someone comes and say, oh, I can, I can do that, and then you just have to pay me, file the, I, I will file all your case, and then uh, send it to immigration. And there was one lady, a Mexican-American lady, oh no, it was an American lady, who was doing that, and even, <laughs> even got in trouble to a judge, to immigration, because she was falsifying the signature of this judge. So it was a big case, and, and that, that happens. But, but that's a very vulnerable um, uh, population. Um, and then also the peonage, that they are exploited. They, instead of working 40 hours, they work more hours, long, long hours, sometimes without breaks, and they are exploited and not paid. And we have a case of a restaurant, a chain of restaurants who are doing that, and then they were not, uh, they were, they were not paying for the whole work that they did, and they were uh, living in very deplorable um, conditions. Then we have domestic violence. The domestic violence, if they are married to a U.S. citizen or resident, and they know the undocumented uh, status of the victim, their, their documented status, the undocumented status, they use it as a weapon to continue the violence. If you if you leave, I'm going to the uh, I'm going to call ICE and I'm going to call immigration and you're going to be deported. You have no rights with the children because you have no documents. You cannot do this. So they use the documented undocumented status as a weapon to continue being violent. And without knowing that victim that they also have rights. And that's when the evaluations come into. Uh oh. Yeah. Okay. Don't worry, don't panic. So, um, so it's a very vulnerable population. And sometimes um, when I work with them, um, some of them, uh, especially when they are coming from um, the villages, like um, in Guatemala or in El Salvador, um, they don't, they went, they, sometimes they went to first, second grade of education. They don't know how to read and write. I need to help them to do that, fill up the forms. And then, um, and then uh, they, <coughs> they, are, uh, they are not present, they, they don't know the, the, they don't know how to navigate the system, period. And as a psych psychologist, we are not going to be providing services, but I also, we are going to guide them how to navigate the system. I'm pretty sure that you have found it to be an advocate without even thinking that you were going to become one, and then to empower them by providing information of what their rights are. So, um, the type of visas, and that's the next slide. You have it? Yes. The next one. The U visas, we talked about the U visas uh, before, and this is a qualifying crime, okay? So for immigrants that are here victims of a crime, they can apply for a visa, but there has some conditions. You have to report that crime, and you have to help the police in the prosecution and investigation of the crime. So how can I explain it to my clients is if the police say, frog, you jump. Okay, so you have to do everything that the police ask you. If they wanted to go and um, identify the possible, uh, the possible suspect, you go to the lineup. This visa, this type of visa, needs a certification. They need a signature of an officer that is endorsing the application with immigration saying that you cooperated with the law enforcement, either the prosecution or even the judge can sign that form. You come into place here. The, the other requirement by the end of the law, it is that that victim have to suffer substantially, either physically or mentally. So some of the victims say, but did not shoot me? I'm fine, I'm fine. And then I ask you, do you have nightmares? Are you afraid right now to walk in the street? Uh, are you hypervigilant of your surroundings? And then say yes, then most of the time say yes. And that is when you come into place because I refer them to a psychologist because I have to prove to immigration that they have suffered mentally because of the crime. This is a qualifying crimes. The list, it is just enunciative. For example, simple assault, it is not listed there. But unlawful restraint, it is. So when you think about unlawful, all these definitions are by state, state code. In Ohio, 
The unlawful restraint, it is probably that I just hold you and I don't let you leave, or probably I close the door for a moment or two and I don't let you leave. That will be unlawful restraint. And then I ask you, how can I be unlawful restraint, a qualifying crime, and if I punch you, I kick you, it would not be. So how I have argued with immigration officer about these cases, it is if I punch you and I kick you, I have to hold you to punch you and kick you. And that's restraint of liberty, right? I cannot, if I don't punch you, then it is just pretty much a blunt in the air, right? So we have to be creative. And the beauty of this it is that you can be creative with immigration officers and the judge. So if they arrive and you have a client that has just an assault, talk to your attorney and just make sure that you are analyzing the type of crime for which they are applying. And the other ones, they it is just self-explanatory. They have to be very violent. Domestic violence, uh, kidnapping, uh, peonage, uh, all of them, they are just listed there. And they are victims and they are clients that they have suffered more than one time. And you have to be careful in those situations as well. Can you go back and give a Yes. Can you define the differences between the sexual, sexual exploitation? The sexual assault? Because those are the referrals that I get often. And mm. a lot of times it's not as clearly defined in terms of Yeah, and this definition, I can give you a general definition. Uh, you should talk to your attorney about what is the definition of the state code. And this, they came up, who, who was the one that came up with the list? It was Congress. So they wanted to just put all of it in there, and some of them, they will overlap. So, but the more that the definition that you're talking about trafficking, and uh, they will, the conduct will overlap, because trafficking and sex, sexual exploitation, it go hand to hand. Uh -huh. Yes. And uh, but sexual assault, you can have sexual assault without the trafficking. Does all of them in the room, ha we know the difference between trafficking and smuggling? Okay, I will say it because I don't see you interacting with me. So uh, trafficking, it means that you are, it can be with visa or without visa, but you came to the country for the reasons to be exploited, either labor exploitation, sexual exploitation, which uh, we have also children exploitation, we have organs, uh, trafficking with organs, but it has to be because of the re very reason to be exploited, to be using you for a crime. And the whole of this, it is just a crime. And the smuggling, it is you paying somebody to cross borders, but that somebody will not tend to keep the relationship after you cross the border for exploitation. How many of you came to the airport and started noticing that there is a lot of posters of human trafficking? That's good, but why is that? Because in the, we're in Las Vegas. Well, I know Las Vegas is like one of the Yeah. I was noticing in the women's restroom, yeah. there was mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, exactly. I have not had these type of cases, sadly, because they are so out of reach. And the, the, the couple cases that I have been in contact with, they have been referred to uh, uh, other providers, like legal aid or something like that. Um, I work for uh, the Organization of American States tracing the routes of human trafficking. And you will find that where trafficking are passing the victims, it is the same routes where the smuggling uh, activities happen. So it can be arms, it can be people, it can be drugs. They are not coming up with the new routes, it is the same. So you can have a, a, a client that have, ha that have had the different classifications in their lives. Any other questions about the qualifying crimes? The victims. We run into also confusions about the victims. The direct victim is obvious. If I want to rob somebody or I get robbed, I am the one that is being robbed, so I'm the direct victim, right? But what happened if here in the conference I'm talking to you and all of a sudden my purse disappears? 
And I don't even notice. I don't know who that ha who uh, did it. Um, there is not involvement of violence. It's just theft. So the crime has to happen to me to be a qualifying crime, even though I am the direct victim. Then, then we talk about indirect victims. And I see this type of scenarios mostly with child abuse. So indirect victim, it is not that you are there. It is that because in capacity of the victim, you step forward, you step in and help the police. So if a 14-year-old is assaulted, then the mom or dad is supposed to go and report the crime, correct? So the indirect victim becomes the dad or the mom or both. And this tends to happen when, they, you, when the victim it is a US citizen. We don't need papers for the US citizen because it's already a citizen. We need papers for the parents. So the parents are the ones that is helping the prosecution or the investigation, and they are the indirect victims. And this is when we have a difficulty convincing the police or the law enforcement to certify them because they wanted to actually see the direct victim name written in the form. Then we come to bystanders victims. Those are the witnesses. So if I'm here, let's say that we are here, and all of a sudden, God forbid, but somebody come in, so, and it's just directed, the, the force is directed to somebody, and the other, other ones are just spectators, you become witnesses. So you are bystanders of that crime, and you qualify for that visa as well. So it sounds like you have been working with U visas, right? Uh, have you worked with U visas cases? Or? Uh, really Different, maybe we are going to talk about the other ones, yeah. And no U visas, no okay. So the U visas, what I do is like, um, in my report, where I, when I write down the report, I go in terms of, first of all, when I see uh, a person, usually is referred by a lawyer and there is already a case open and then the, the crime is already said, it was already reported, it's, it's already, everything is in order. So when I see them, I already know that that happened. Usually I ask them to bring the report so because they usually get confused with dates and times and things like that. And when I write that my, my report, and if they, the other information contradicts 1962 or to 1961, it's out. Uh, because they are saying that it's not, it was, this person was not saying the truth. Even though you can understand when it's, there is a confusion or something. So I try to get my dates really clear by the report and by consulting with the lawyer, uh, who usually has all the documentation. Then I go in terms of what happened. And when I, when I said what happened, I tell them, describe, the, describe what happened like if it would be a movie. So what the perpetrator did, what did he say, what, what did he approach? So I write down all what the perpetrator did and how the mental suffering that he might or she provoking, how the severity of the harm, how long it took, did they go to the hospital, they didn't, and if they didn't, why they didn't go? Sometimes they don't go to the hospital because they don't have health insurance, and they are thinking it's going to cost me. And then, uh, but then I said, <clears throat> there are some lacerations in the body or, in the face or whatever physical harm I could witness. Or the, this person is uh, uh, reporting that uh, it was a result of the crime. Um, and then how was that person feeling? Um, so if the perpetrator was an English speaking person and this person didn't speak the language, it is very terrifying to, to see someone get a, with a gun or a knife and you don't understand what this person is saying. So there is a lot of um, emotional uh, reactions in there. And then, um, <clears throat> then I go to the history of the client. Again, like I was saying, I go into all the immigration process because sometimes they are coming from, uh, from places where they have been victims of crime in the past, although I am not assessing that at that moment, I'm not assessing the one that is going to qualify for immigration relief, but it is, it is I do that because I can pose the vulnerability that this person may have and they, because they could say, oh, but it was only this, but no, 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 and then I will say, no, but it happened this, but before there was trauma, and this person was vulnerable to develop even for trauma because 
uh, because that happened in the country or, or because uh, it, it is ex uh, they are exposed to, to something new that is exacerbating previously uh, presented symptoms. One thing that I hear a lot from clients is like, I didn't know that this was going to happen to me in the United States. I thought that coming to the United States, I was going to be safe. I didn't know I was, this also uh, um, exists in here, and in their mind is that there is no safe uh, place in the world for them to feel safe. So those are the things that I usually put in my report with the, in terms of the mental um, suffering in the data. And then, um, Usually, I accompany my reports with objective measurements. I don't do only what they're saying, but I, I like to look at the severity of the symptoms, if there are some symptoms. I'm putting these because those are the ones that are translated in Spanish and norm for that population, but if you work with other population, then you probably need to do more digging in terms of what kind of instruments are available for you. But the Beck Depressive Inventory is the one that uh, is easy to read, easy for them to understand, the Beck Anxiety. The Outcome Questionnaire is, I give that test because sometimes I have to see them back again for any reason that they send it to me so I can see how, how the progress of how, how, how are they there and how are they now. And then the Detail Assessment of Post Traumatic Distress, that is, uh, I use that a lot because that test not only assess how you are functioning now in terms of trauma, but how you were functioning when that happened. So it asks you, it asks you how, when that occurred, and then they go with a lot of questions. There are about 103 questions. It has also a validity scale in terms of uh, positive or negative image, and then also has alcohol use because PTSD is associated with alcohol. And then, uh, and then, and then um, it has, I really like that. The only thing uh, is that the detailed assessment post-traumatic stress is, it was based on the DSM-4, and it's not, it, I don't know, it's, it's in the DSM-5. So if I want to do that, then I go to the trauma symptom inventory that's available in Spanish as well. That, that uh, also is like 103 and also has validity scales and also gets uh, into the um, trauma symptoms, depression, anxiety, and other common things that we find when someone who suffers for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. When I use the personality assessment inventory or the MMPI, the Milan I just added there because I know it's there, but I don't use it. Uh, but the personality assessment inventory and the MMPI, I use it more the MMPI when there is a question of credibility because of the malingering. Uh, there is a Spanish version, MMPI too, and then <clears throat> If I want to establish the credibility of that person, then I give that test for the malingering skills that I can that I can say. The personality assessment inventory I use it rarely with Spanish-speaking uh, clients unless I I need to, because it's very confusing for them, and it's very confusing to answer. And the items are like very 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 culturally. Is that the, your experience too? Sometimes the MMPI I find it easy because it's a yes and not. The other one is. There's the five uh, scales, and then they get really confused with that. And then some of the items um, that they are posting in there um, are very like, <clears throat> for example, one of the items that always pops into my mind is that, do you always receive the mail that you want to receive? Or something like that is the question. Meaning that we always get like mail that we don't want to. Uh, but usually they don't get mail. You know, so how are they going to answer? I'm not saying, yeah, when I get mail, it's the one that I want to receive, right? And then that's, that's, that's some items that I find like I don't, I, I don't like to uh, administer that with Spanish speaking unless uh, I have to. But the MMPI, I will be more inclined to use with them. So we have a, here a case for you. So it's time to wake up and be didactic <laughs> because this is a workshop, okay? So in 2004, Miguel entered to the US. And while in transit to the US, of course, he was traveling undocumented, he was held captive at the border. The smugglers contacted the family and asked for a ransom. Eventually, the ransom was paid and he was released. He, was entered, to, he entered to the country undocumented, and later on, 2010, met 
a lady, not a really nice lady, because they have an abusive relationship. On 2012, he went and cashed his check to a Mexican store, and outside of the Mexican store, he was robbed at gunpoint, and then he reported the crime. He's applying for a U visa, and the attorney has referred Miguel to you for the mental suffering assessment. Is there something that comes into your mind right away that you should do? Not all at once. Yes? Yeah, he referred to you because they want to determine um, the mental suffering. And um, you know that all of this happens to, happened to Miguel. He was a victim of kidnapping. He was a victim of domestic relation, domestic violence, and he was a victim of aggravated robbery. And you know that he's applying for some type of relief because all this victimization. So what do you do now? You have this client in front of you, and uh, you are making an assessment of the mental suffering of all his life, so what do you do? What is something that it will come to your mind? You want to talk to the attorney, maybe? Please talk to the attorney, I beg you. Talk to the attorney, because we have three incidents here where he was a victim of a crime, and you can be evaluating the substantial mental suffering of all of it. And uh, we, all these cases, we have learned from it, right? And uh, we have a case, of course, this is not the right facts because of confidentiality agreement, we just took it, but the right information is there. So we have that evaluation and then immigration came back with a request for more evidence and said, um, yes, Miguel suffered a lot. There is no doubt that he was a victim of a qualifying crime in the U visa, but we don't know if that crime, the, the one that he's applying for, caused him the mental suffering, or it was because all of it that happened in his life. So this is when you should talk to the attorney. I'm sorry. This is when you should talk to the attorney. And now when you have convoluted situations of cases and areas of, you, you should talk to them and say, what do you want me to do? What are you looking for? What is that? Explain me the type of relief that this person is applying to. So you know what you should be focusing in. But would you give us an example in that scenario? Mm -hmm. But the question is about the pre-existing. What would the attorney advise? What, how would the attorney help the psychologist? Yes, I, we talk about the past experience as aggravated factors that contributed to the substantial mental suffering of the aggravated robbery. And that immigration, in the RFE, they gave us, an, they gave us some elements. We will count into consideration the substantial mental suffering. If you can tell me, if you can explain me how the aggravating factors in those past situations impacted in the aggravated robbery because we were applying only for the aggravated robbery and they took in consideration those the aggravating factors from the past trauma. Maybe you can explain that so, better. So one of the things that I do um, is like um, when I talk about that, I, I first I, I, I focus on what I need to focus for that for, for that visa. And then I talk a little bit about the history and about what they were exposed. I do a lot of research. I mean, I, ha I already have my reference list in terms of like uh, victims of sexual abuse and what is going to happen, likely to happen in, during their adult lives, the trauma, and how is that translated and how is that seen. And I back up anything that I said with, with uh, the studies that have, be, that have been done and that can support whatever I'm saying. So usually I integrate that. I have had, um, how do you call it, RFs? RFEs. RFEs RF is, is when immigration sends a letter to the attorney or the client and says, that's not enough. Or those, those, how do I know that these crimes happen and is not, and is suffering uh, emotional harm because of that and not this? And that's when we jump. And then we, we said, uh, 
I believe that this happened, that happened, but made this person vulnerable to develop even further symptomatology, and then you go with your clinical diagnostic and your clinical judgment. So I guess my question to you is, like, you know, in clinical psychology assessments, we learn to do kind of detailed uh, interview um, that look at not just what happened in this incident, but going back in time. So would you be doing that anyway mm -hmm. and considering that those are aggravating Right, and then, uh, and of course, do you do that routinely or do I do that routine, routinely, and I try to integrate it the best I can without making the report very lengthy because they're not going to read it if I do it, and, and writing the report in a very basic language because otherwise they don't understand. So when I said, oh, the bag has mild uh, symptoms of depression, they say, oh, they are mild, and I explain, no, mild means clinical significant still, and it's a clinical uh, level, so, but I have to explain that in the report. I have to tell them and, and use the words that they can understand because otherwise it's... Yeah, that we have an RFE for the mild as well. Um, what I do with the reports, it is I also write in the reports, do an, a star, and I will just comment on that. Uh, that is valid. There is no rule where it says you cannot handwrite in the forms and in the reports because you have to know that they do not, are not trained in this, and sometimes we just forget about it because we deal with this type of language in a daily basis, and we assume, again, that we assume, where everybody is gonna be trained with the same language, and it's not. So in that case, we had to come back, and uh, I talked to Erendira, and I explained what is the RFE meaning, and what immigration was saying that they didn't believe that the client was suffering from that specific aggravated robbery. And uh, I think that we went back and separated the incidents. And then we said, well, for example, I don't know, I will, the letter that then I provide to immigration said, well, for example, after the kidnapping, he had trouble sleeping. After the abusive relationship, he sometimes, you know, he had nightmares and he couldn't sleep just three days in the week. After the aggravated robbery, he cannot sleep five days in a week. So this is aggravating uh, the conditions of the client as, of course, the aggravated robbery has some effects in his mental suffering. Yes? So it kind of reminds me, for those of us that do forensic work more generally, of all the stuff with personal injury cases mm -hmm. or workers' comp cases where you're being asked, okay, how you know, mm -hmm. does this sort of pre-existing stuff ultimately lead to sort of the final incident that results in the person being unable to work mm -hmm. or filing a personal injury. And you're always, I think, as psychologists being asked to clarify and parse out how much of this past trauma history is influencing what you're seeing now. And also, I'm guessing, having to deal with individuals who are suspicious of claims and think people could be exaggerating yeah, yes. that's absolutely right. But we are going to get into other cases that, which is not visa, well, this is a little bit more clear cut, but we are going to talk about the ones that are not. <laughs> uh -huh. And we need to hurry because yes. the time. Uh -huh. would, would there be information you don't want to go into the report that could actually harm the client? Always. I read the reports extensively, but it depends on case by case. Um, I say, you can say everything you want to, but you have to choose your words. My, my line of work it is choosing my right words. So if I wanted to say that a client was using fake documents, something like that, I would try to be very careful on that scenario and see if that is going to impact your diagnosis. If it's not, just leave it out or talk to the attorney whether you want to include it or not. Yes? Uh, in cases with undocumented immigrants who have sustained violent episodes or a crime against them, as you've mentioned, they may be very reluctant to report this because, in effect, they are exposing themselves and their, their current status. So if the client comes to you and they said, I had these three episodes that, uh, that transpired, do you try to, uh, I would imagine, substantiate that these episodes actually occurred rather than, I mean, do you go with the patient's uh, account or do you go with where is the solid evidence? 
that yes, these things actually occurred in formulating your opinion? Me as an attorney? I, if they well, claim... As an attorney, if the client is telling me that he was held hostage at the border and then he was in an abusive relationship, but then he was an ag robbed at one point and he has a report and he didn't report the domestic violence, neither the kidnapping, I will go with his account uh, just because his testimony, we will file an affidavit, I file an affidavit with a U visa, and he gets to tell his, his story. Immigration will not care about the past incidents if we have evidence of the reporting of the aggravated robbery, because that is the criminal activity that will make him qualify. That is my point of view. Yeah, that's, that's exactly where I go. I mean, I usually, um, when they refer to me, I already have that. So it's not like they are knocking at my door and saying, hey, can you do this evaluation? <coughs> there is all, there is all, something that it's uh, an evidence that that happened. And I think that you touch a very good point, and I will get into ethical considerations. But we uh, need to hurry up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but you have a question, and I don't want to just move on. The next. Well, actually, very similar question, but I guess just to add one piece on it would be, what would you have done in the case of Miguel if that third incident hadn't happened? And it was two incidents that happened that in all likelihood were not connected. Yeah. As a clinician, you know, you start to but then you will be in the point that attorney it is already taking the case and it know what what to do right or or if you're talking more as a therapy right you just um, if, no, in terms of evaluation if an attorney calls me and says these two incidents happened at the border we don't have records of that evaluate the damages okay um, it, it puts I think it would be a difficult position not knowing if it occurred. Where would be like um, she, she or he claims that this happened and this is what this person is telling me. As a psychologist, I've been trained to assess the mental status of my client and if that is a psych psychological uh, <clears throat> impact of what this person is claiming or not. It will be uh, just like that. Now, if you see the document, then I saw it and it was an aggravated robbery or whatever. Yeah. I think just quickly, some of the issues between these kinds of forensic evaluations and other kinds of, we don't have that, tri that triangulation of the data because people are coming and they don't bring papers with them that talk about all of this. And so that, I think, is, it, it makes it more difficult when, as an expert, you're on the stand um, and having to say, well, how did you know that? How do you know that that mm -hmm. is, is true? And so, there, there are ways of doing that, but I think that it's, it's a different kind of evaluation than when we have other forensic it is a different kind. I, 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 I have never been, I mean, I only have been once in court, that's it. So I'm on, I mean, maybe this is Colorado, I'm in court all the time. Yeah, but, but the type of these evaluations usually did not require that you go, yeah, right. So I will ask you, what type of cases are you in court for? So I'm on immigration cases on asylum. An asylum. Asylum. Asylum is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, U visas do not go to court, yeah. to immigration court, because immigration court does not have jurisdiction over U visas, but that's a different subject. But going to that, um, for example, we are going to see VAWA, and I will go here, and I will go back, but just because we mentioned in that. The VAWA does not need reporting. So you will have a client that has been saying, I suffer domestic abuse, and you don't have something to go with. Um, the law doesn't require it, and when I refer that client to the psychologist, I am hoping that the psychologist will have some magic and some tools underneath their slip to tell me whether or not, you know, to explain to immigration that that patient or that client, it is credible. And also, when I have that report, I tend to compare with the evidence that I have, let's say. So I have the report, and sometimes I don't open the case until I have the report. I have the report, I sit down with the client again, and I'm still comparing what I have with the report with what he told me in the very first consultation, what I have, because probably I, I will have, I must have, a um, certificate of marriage, and I need documents from witnesses or some corroborating evidence that he was abused, his declaration, his letter. So I go about, about okay, you tell me this, and then you tell to the psychologist that, and, uh, but then you're saying in this other piece of document that something else happened which is not actually fitting in the, in the timeline. So I, I go back with a client, um, 
And that's the only way that I can make sure to have every, all the dogs in a row. So um, uh, domestic violence is one of, that it goes on there, you can go to the next, um, that goes into the With visa the, you. We didn't um, talk to the, in the TV. I, I, I think we should. Okay, yeah. TV visa, everybody's clear on that. As I just, I just want to briefly mention, especially immigrant juvenile status, it is for unaccompanied kids. People that are, tra minors that are traveling to the United States without parents, they can apply for a residency, but the caveat is this, and it's depending on your state. The majority age in Ohio is 18. You have to go to juvenile court and somebody has to petition for the custody. And in, within the custody orders, they have to be magical words saying that he was abused, neglected, or abandon. So most, most of the time, I don't have to include a psychological report in this type of situations, but you may have uh, a client that is under these situations. Um, they don't have to be abandoned by the two parents. It can be either or. So if it's living by mom, but dad abandoned them, still they can apply for SHS, but they have to hurry to file that complaint in juvenile court because if they are above the majority of age in this in your state, they are out of luck. Do you want to talk about that? Um, so just briefly, um, when I do um, visa you domestic violence, I usually, um, I have the two, um, two, the two things that I guide me to do the assessment with the victim, because usually sometimes they don't know how to explain the experience, and then they thought that if they were holding their money, that was something okay, which when it's not. So then um, there is also a wheel that is similar for the immigrant person that you can access via internet that will give you an idea of where you can go in terms of assessing that and incorporating that in your report. And then we have here in asylum. Um, asylum, you can apply for asylum in two ways, and it depends whether or not you are arrested and referred to immigration court. So we have defensive and affirmative. That is what we call defensive. Obviously, you are defending yourself or being deported, then you are filing an asylum application. And the other way, it is an affirmative asylum application. You, nobody's trying to deport you, but you are going by yourself to file that application in immigration offices. Remember the agencies? So a filing application, asylum application, will be with the agency that grants the benefits inside the United States, UCIS. And then if you don't win your case, you have a second chance, a second bite of the apple, because you can be referred to immigration court if it is denied here. So see the setting. And the setting tells you a lot. The setting here in affirmative asylum application, it is you, the officer, the applicant, and a, hopefully an attorney, or and the translator. Non-adversarial here. But then we have here in the courtroom, and just by the look of it, it looks imposing, right? So if it imposes you, imagine how the client feels. So the client will be, uh, where is the witness stand? I think that is here. The judge is obviously here. And, uh, you know, here is going to be the attorney and here is going to be the prosecutor. So this is the two type of asylums. And you should be, you should know what the type of asylum they are applying for. So what is asylum? Asylum means that you are fleeing persecution. It is not that I fear from a country, I fear that something is going to happen to me, so I'm just going to run into the United States. And the clients do not understand that. They say, well, something is going to happen in my country. If they deport me, I must apply for an asylum. And I say, no. Generalized violence do not, can't amount to asylum. You have to fear or you have to be persecuted for the reasons that the United States have recognized protection upon. So there are just some type of protections that the United States will give. If you are persecuted because of race, religion, nationality, and then we come into the last two, which is a little bit murky, membership of a particular social group or political opinion. And that is the work of the attorney to actually find that. And I'm just going to put the latest of the case law, um, what we see a lot, or I see a lot with my clientele, and the part membership of a particular social group where a male and woman who cannot leave a common law marriage, a political opinion, business owner who did not, denies paying taxes or quotas 
to the mayors, to the gangs. And why political opinion, you will say? Well, because the mayor matters, or the gangs, in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, and also Mexico, they are defined as a de facto government. So they are the ones imposing the rules. They are the governments in these countries because the police cannot police because the mayors are the ones controlling. So it doesn't matter how much you want to do against the mayors, you cannot go and report the crime or the extortion because the police is going to tell the mayors or they are corrupted. The police is completely corrupted, corrupted and the government as well. So the mayors, the gangs are a de facto government. And if you are opposing to the mayors, that means that you are opposing to the government. And the practice of the mayors are that they are going to be charging the business owners or sometimes just the people that lives in your town, a quota. And that quota, since they are acting as a government, it is a tax. So if I don't want to pay your taxes, government, because I do not agree with the form that you're ruling in my town, there is a political opinion involved in there. So they, again, be creative. And immigration attorneys, we try to be creative with all the facts that we have to provide a better service for our client and our community. I don't know, you work with asylums, right? Yeah, I did. You did a lot of, um, under number four, uh, sexual orientation as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's true. Have you seen more influx of asylums lately? I, yeah, I, and I don't know what's going on, but there is a lot of, I don't know if in your cases, the asylum cases, and it's more like number four, what I am seeing a lot, and number five, a lot as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will be interested in where's your clients coming from, which? Um, immigration court, immigration attorneys. No, but uh, which country they are, they are fleeing from? Mm-hmm, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we have then uh, the factor to account for indigenous, uh, if you are discriminated uh, for being indigenous. So this is at the asylum. Yes. Let me, let me just, um, when, when you work uh, with them, do you work with interpreters? Yes. So, so one of the things, one of my suggestions is that be careful because uh, people in the mountains in Guatemala, they say we instead of I. Yeah. They, 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 they talk and they're going to probably try, uh, interpret exactly how they're saying. So just to be able to really identify, like say, what do you mean we? Who is we? And then they said me. And then so because that sometimes even me that I do in Spanish, I get confused. Wait. Actually, one of the things a lot of sessions sometimes to do an interview because it's re-traumatizing to the oh, yes. people who are having these uh, interviews. And um, another problem, Christina, I don't know if you have the answer to this, is that uh, folks at the interview can do evaluations for, although these are often successful, between the time the interview is done and they actually get asylum is quite a long time. Yes. And there's no access to services during so, so even though you now interviewed these people, you recognize the problem that they have or the suffering that they're going through. There's nothing you can do about it right. to give them free service for a lengthy period of time. Sadly, that's true. And I can explain you why is the lengthy process, at least in immigration court. And UCIS had prioritized their asylum applications, but <laughs> prioritizing doesn't mean that they will come with an interview in two weeks or in a month. So when we go to immigration court, we file an application for asylum, and then the judge asks you, do you want accelerated hearing or non-accelerated hearing? And when you say, well, I explain to my client that this is uh, the option, and they say, well, what does that mean? Non-accelerated, does that mean that they will give me how much time? And it depends on the judge docket. Sometimes it is two years, four years, five years, and because of the re-traumatization, they don't want to tell the story one more time or how many times more because they have probably tell the story to the CBP officer, to asylum officers already countless times and they don't want you to want peace. So when they tell them, well, it probably will take five years and they say, please give me that. 
give me peace, five years. So if we go on five years because you decide the non-accelerated docket, that means that it's your fault because you are requesting that and they cannot get an employment documentation authorization because of that. Because we have a clock, an imaginary clock in asylum. So you, it has to be 180 days for the applicant to be able to, to apply for EADs, employment documentation authorizations. But then you can actually, when you can also explain to that to the client and if the client say, well, we would go with accelerated calendar and maybe the next hearing that they have available is in two years. You just wait for the clock to get where it has to be and then you apply for an EAD and maybe they can have an option for other services. Um, my recommendation, it will be go to the Catholic charities Sometimes they're able to provide services that asylum seekers or refugees need. But other than that, we are all in the same boat, unfortunately. Yeah? 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Let's talk about the hardships. Uh, we have 15 minutes left. Um, then I want to play a video for you. I think that is very impacting. type of cases where we have the hardships. I don't particularly know the specifics of, on this case to actually know why a waiver was not filed, where we are not doing consular processing. But there's many type of waivers. Um, what is the process to apply for a permanent residency? Remember that we talk about commoners and the petition from US uh, citizens and so forth. But for those that they are entered without documents to the United States, they cannot apply for the residency here in the United States. They have to leave the country and wait the approval to come back in. And why do you think that that was structured that way? Because they say, well, let's to be really, really smart here. If they do not qualify for the residency and we make them leave the country and we deny the approval, then we don't have to deport them because they will be in the home country already. See? So that's the reason that they did all that circle to go for the immigrant to go back to the home country and wait for the approval. We call all this uh, process consular processing because the final step is at the consulate in their home country of the immigrant. We are going to be talking, uh, and you, ha you have seen probably this, this uh, language, exceptional, unusual, extreme, extreme and unusual hardship, and unconscionable hardship. He, this ones, they're, not, they're rarely seen or rarely talked. We are going to be here more in this spectrum. So extreme hardship waivers, what are we talking about? It is going to be, surprisingly, you're going to see the same factor in the cases, but it's just the degree of the hardship that the U.S. citizen of or the kid, the U.S. citizen kid, has to suffer in order for that case to be approved. And it also depends where that case is located at. So what we'll see... I want to explain something, the 601A and 601 only, without the A. We have, in immigration, 
what is called the inadmissibility grounds. And they are just the reasons why you don't want a person to stay here in the country. And they are so lengthy, very lengthy. But just say that, as I explained to the clients, it will be the reason why you will not accept a random person into your house. Would you accept a rapist into your house? Well, no. Would you accept a person that has extensive criminal convictions? Probably not. So let's start with that conversation. Some of the inadmissibilities that a person might have, it is the bars. Remember the bars that I explained to you, the three and the 10 year bars. So if you came in first and you stay 100 days and left three years, and then you stay one year and left 10 years. And the Obama administration said, well, that is a, for just that administrative violation, that's a rather harsh to separate a family. Let's try to find us some other way. And just because also the Congress, it was not doing something, Obama came up with this. And uh, there is a fallacy in all of this that Trump or Obama can change the immigration system. Well, they can introduce a law, a bill, but actually it's the Congress that has to act upon it. So just to be mindful of that. So Obama came with a 601A, and the A means that the waiver is going to be filed here in the United States rather than the consulate. What that means it is that the immigrant doesn't have to wait abroad waiting for that approval, and meanwhile, they are separated from their family. So trying to shorten the length of time that people are going to be separated, family unity, but the A only applies for the three and the 10 year bar, only, okay? So in order for the immigrant to be waived that administrative violation, they have to show extreme, extreme hardship upon the US citizen. And that's where you come into place because then you will not be assessing the victim, you will be assessing the US citizen. And I can, and I can add more when we are talking, but this, the, the, these factors that are mentioned in here, those are the ones that I mentioned in my report for the waiver. So, um, so the length of race and conditions of health. So basically the interview starts happening when they call me to make an appointment and then um, they start telling me that they are applying for the waiver, they call it waiver, and then um, I, I talk to the US citizen or the resident because residents also can do that. Um, um, and then I said, okay, so have you been diagnosed with this and that and that? Bring me all the records, bring me all your health records, Records, bring me uh, if you have been diagnosed, taking medication, uh, anything that can help me to substantiate the case. Do you have children? Yes. Are the children having any difficulties in the school? Bring me the IEP. I know how to explain the IEP in the report. Bring me uh, the, the a diagnosis of autism because I will be able to talk about that. So, so I start guiding them in what kind of documentations I need to see when I see them so I can integrate all this information into the report. The 601 without the A, it is for other type of inadmissibilities. So that is that distinction. And again, you have to talk to the attorney. And if you don't understand, ask questions until you understand. They should be glad to talk to you. I am glad at least. Um, so as I was saying, uh, we can have this Similar scenarios, but the degree is what impacts. And uh, not all the clients that are applying for the same type of waivers. And uh, as I wanted to point it out to my clients, we have to evaluate the economical situation. How is it here? How would it be if you are deported? Who will be sustaining the family? Let's try to talk about the emotional part. How the wife or the husband that is a U.S. citizen and lawful permanent resident will be impacted here or in Mexico, in Mexico probably, or the home country of the immigrant, it will not have the support system that they have here. Uh, we talk about the opportunities, the professional opportunities also for the U.S. citizen, the lawful permanent resident. So there's many scenarios where you can start asking or I can start, I start my consultations from. And after I get enough information that I think that the U.S. citizen of the lawful permanent resident will suffer extreme hardship, then I open the case and I refer to the psychologist. So um, one of the things that when I see them and I integrate this uh, data uh, together, 
I always think I'm just focusing on the functioning. They usually like for me or in the report to focus about the U.S. citizen, the adult U.S. citizens, the spouse, female, or the male, uh, or or whatever the situation is. Um, and then um, I focus on that, but I integrate the children as well. Again, if they are doing well, how they are doing in the school, grades, everything that I can gather and then say what it will be the impact. So in my mind is, if, if there is an involuntary separation in here, how they are going to be affected, if they relocate to the country or if they stay in the country. And I divide that, those thoughts in my mind when I'm uh, doing my, my diagnostic assessment. I see the children as well, I see them interact, I see how they are uh, doing, how they are bonding or not, how they are interacting with their parents. Not that I'm doing an evaluation of parenthood, but I can say how emotionally stable is the family or the unity, or how, what am I observing? So, <clears throat> so then, um, I include that into the, into the evaluation. Another thing that I keep in mind is that I'm not making that determination. Sometimes I have cases that I'm like, ooh, she's emotionally functioning well. I mean, things, what am I going to say? No, history, no, probably you guys have covered it, right? So, so everything, so I just said. But then it comes a hypothesis. If I'm seeing that there is bonding between this marriage and these families together, what will be the impact of separation on children or the U.S. citizen? And there are articles there. I mean, I already, uh, I already probably you have those, but there are articles over there that they have been uh, researching in the impact of uh, deportation and separation, relocation, or when they stay here. So those are the ones that I integrate. Can I ask a quick question? Sure this topic. Um, I'm just wondering, um, are there cases that you experience where you feel that you have not met that criterion of extreme uh, and unusual? And what do you do then? I write my report and it's, it's, I mean, I have, I just write my report. I cannot receive information. So I write down my report. And there was one case that we have, and I said, you know what, Dave, you are going to submit it, but I'm not seeing anything, but I'm going to write down, and hypothetically, what will happen to the family, because it's going to happen, something to the children and the, and the U.S. citizen. They took it, they say yes. They, we got an approval. <laughs> they got approval, and there are some other cases that I'm like, yes, this person has a strong case, and then I get this question, questioning this and that, and then I have to clarify. So it depends on who is reading your report. It's you, the officer. Yeah, it's the I know, officer. and maybe they don't have a strong suffer, emotional suffering, but maybe they will have a hardship economically. <clears throat> and uh, in this type of case, in the 601A, the hardship it should be upon the spouse or the parent, depending, but not the kids. Sadly, immigration doesn't care about the kids in this type of cases. So it doesn't matter how much the kids will be suffering, it will impact the suffering that the mother will have if the, she sees the kid suffering. Is that clear? But then that would be in all cases. But you lose credibility if you say in every case, every undocumented. Uh, yes, I don't, I don't like generalized uh, hypotheses because when we talk about general uh, reports, then it means that we lose uh, the credibility, credibility on that specific instance, yes. Mm -hmm. So hypothetically, you can say, but in any case, but then it is your clinical judgment to see how, what the extent of language you are going to be using, or what you are going to be saying, <coughs> she said, or is my impression, or, 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 or based on this, I can predict this, and, and, but you, the, the language needs to be very clear that you don't know, but you think or, or they are saying. And then in that way, that's the way that I manage that. Yeah. I'm not a psychologist, but I will ask this to my client. Maybe they can be functioning right now at the present time because everything is fine, correct? But I will ask her, what does it happen to you when you start thinking about his deportation? Does your palms start sweating? Do you start um, breathing heavily? Uh, what do you do when you have that catastrophic thoughts? And that, I do that in those Oh, no. Oh, okay. Well, I do that. And I do that in the affidavits. So that's why I'm saying I, I'm not a psychologist, but that's what I do. And uh, that hypothesis 
helps with immigration. Because here, it is not that we have just to focus on what is happening right now. We also have to think, what would it happen if he is deported or she's deported? So that's what I said. I, I made that my waiver <laughs> before speaking. Uh, we have another which is cancellation of removal. And remember that I talked to you about the, specific, the specificity of the language. Here, we have except, exceptional and extremely and unusual hardship. So the threshold is much, much higher. If we come back to the spectrum of hardship, then we have, it will be right here. It is not unconscionable but it's right here. So it has to be exceptional, it has to be extreme, and it has to be unusual for the court to cancel a removal case. What is a removal, what is a cancellation of removal? That is for an individual who uh, it is in court that has been living 10 years in the US continuously, that has behaved good, that has a good moral character, so it means not DUIs, not DVs, domestic violence, no falsification charges, so good moral character, paying taxes, and has a relationship or is closely related to a US citizen. And that US, US citizen will suffer exceptional, extremely, and unusual. So sometimes we have the extremely, but we don't have the unusual. So it is degrees or hardships. And for cancellation or removal, it has to be all the way to the top. So we might have a couple that is suffering um, depression or anxiety. And we have a, here a contrast um, where I put two cases. So we have a single mother with six children and the children do not speak the language of the home country. That can be extreme, but that doesn't qualify for unusual. But then we have a different scenario where we have the mother with just one kid, but that kid is autistic. And in the removal country, in the country of uh, the home country, there is no institution that it will provide services for this autistic kid that might qualify for extreme and unusual and exceptional hardship. So as again, again, it's type of degrees and the type of relief that the immigrant is applying for. One of the things that I was thinking when you were saying now that I was, um, another thing that I do with a US citizen, uh, who, if, if this person is an English speaking person, and I might, if I see that mood is okay or something like that, I give them a personality assessment test to see personality characteristics. And then how the personality characteristics, and then in that way I can hypothesize better in how they are going to react to extreme conditions. Um, that's another thing that I use. I'm sorry that I was not thinking when you asked that, but they were like, yeah, I do the personality assessment test there. So again, this is the, the wheels, and it is just the same factors, it's the type of degrees. And the last topic that we have here is the waivers on naturalization. Um, when I have a client that is not able to speak English and he cannot memorize the 100 questions asked in the naturalization test, then we come with a strategy of the possibility of then applying for a waiver. And the waiver has to be filled out by a doctor or a psychologist. So basically, um, it is a form. Has anybody done that form? You do? You do? Yeah, but except uh, my clients, they didn't know English. I mean, then the problem was that we didn't have any tests to use it. And then I had to do my clinical assessment without any uh, test, actual test. I'll give so you some. That was a problem. What, what, what languages? Armenian, Armenian, and Persian, uh -huh. Farsi. Okay, so basically, one of the, the ones that I do for that, because we are talking about memory here. Why this individual cannot take, or is going to be exempt to take these 100 questions, or study these 100 questions that contain names, foreign names, dates, Right? Uh, they usually contain like who is the president and who is the first house speaker, or mm -hmm. I mean, at uh, uh, the dates and things like that. So the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, and probably you need to check out because you can do access that online. It has like 20, 21 or 22 languages. 
So, um, so then, um, so then that I mean, I use that in Spanish, of course, right? But then, um, but then you can maybe access that, that because they ask you in the form, what instruments do you use to get into your determination? And I don't know. I mean, the diagnostic interview because you are trained, you can do it. Uh, but probably that may be another adding for you if they are speaking another language. The mental health, the mental status examination, what you are referring. And I also have for IQs, I use the Tony, which is a nonverbal test. And then you can use that also for, um, I don't know if it's norm or not, so you have to check that out. But I use the test of nonverbal intelligence. But the only thing is that the test is visual. And then it doesn't, doesn't capture the working memory. But the Montreal Cognitive Assessment captures working memory and then remembering information, plus your diagnostic interview. There are also the neuro C for Spanish speaker, and I already talked about personality, because sometimes it's not uh, a cognitive issue, sometimes it's trauma, PTSD, or severe and chronic level of depression that are not allowing them to concentrate and to be able to learn all this information. You fill up all the forms, submit it, and then they make the determination. Um, one I also use is the Roland, um, which is the, uh, the RUDAS, the Roland Universal Dementia Assessment. RUDAS, thank you. I want to check it out. Thank you. And now we come to the ethical considerations. So I, I got this call from a colleague of mine. I didn't know this colleague, but got my number. Uh, and saying that uh, this person, this colleague, was doing uh, this, uh, the exceptions, the medical exceptions that we were talking about. I don't remember what's the name of the form. 648. Uh, 648. Six, so, and uh, this person was not going to be continue doing it, and if I knew how to do it, and I say, yes, I do. I see clients and I do that. And then um, I said, um, and then um, it continues asking me questions and things like that. And, and then I said, so are you retiring? And I said, well, no, actually my license is being suspended. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh <laughs> okay. So, but you know, this population is it's, uh, very, very great. And I see people who coming from Alaska, and I'm like, who is coming from Alaska to Ohio to do this type of evaluation? And some people here, and I'm like, maybe he's using videotape to assess. I have no idea. But I didn't want to go deeper because I just say, Ugh. Um, so um, then, um, and, and then I comment to her. Uh, because he started alluding that immigration was going after us who were doing this type of war and we were being uh, scrutinized because they don't want us to do this. And then I was commenting with her, saying, no, actually, they like it because they don't understand and they want to understand. So let me do more digging. And then the digging. So I, I belong to AILA, which is the American Immigration Lawyers Association, and we have a chapter in Ohio, and we have a Facebook group. And I start chatting about if somebody had this experience with the psychologist and what was going on. Because uh, we thought that immigration uh, was the one that it tipped or made the complaint. And then I have one of my colleagues stating that it was not, it was actually a client that filed a negligence complaint against him. And it was because, and they having, I have never seen a 648 uh, uh, waiver from him, but it was a very generic one. So it was completely generic, it was, it was just uh, taking the client's name and signing it. So that is negligence. Uh, and that's why I'm assuming that this is, the license got suspended. So it was not immigration. And then also it was a client. Was referred refer me another client, and then this person was from Nepal. And uh, when I was asking, is a 25 year old? I'm like 25 year old who have memory problems, something is deeper here. I cannot just go with these instruments and assess that this person needs a neuropsych evaluation, right? So I refer. So I think, uh, and then I got another call referred by this person again, 
leaving a message and I have to answer. That uh, wants to go into an assessment and then that uh, wants to be seen uh, right away and that uh, this person can provide me a lot of referrals. Red flag. So watch out. <laughs> watch out when you get those calls and then try to look. The way that I see it is like, it, I, I really like that it's referred by an attorney because they already did the investigation and everything, and I don't have to get into that. And then if I don't feel comfortable, I just say no, and I refer them out to, to other, <clears throat> there is a, a person in Indiana or Michigan, and they can make that determination. But just I, I'm just very careful, and I, there are red flags, and there are people who would like to take advantage of this. So, um, so then also, when working with no English speaking Spanish, and I'm pretty sure that you do, you work with translators. And then sometimes in the communities, the, the translators that they use are community members, friends, or children, and they are used to that. So we just have to clarify that I personally, I usually don't work with translators because I speak the language, but I have one time a person from Brazil. So I ask uh, this person to bring a translator. I prefer that the translators are certified by the court, but if not, because there are so, many, so there are few, then a translator that is not a family member or is not that. So um, that's the way that I that I do. And of course, like you were saying, that I refer them out because I didn't have the instrument if I don't have the tools or the skills to, to assess that, uh, that person, then I will refer them out and there is nothing I can do. Um, so then, uh, first, uh, basically when we talk about the waivers, uh, and then basically are the waivers that I focus a little bit more about the context of the country. Um, when I ask them, uh, where are you from? I'm from El Salvador. So El Salvador is a country. What area of El Salvador? And then they get, I get the name. And usually if it's uh, close to the borders, I'm sensing that there is going to be more trauma because the drug smuggling and things like that. But then I do research the place where they are from. I see how the place is, and I just don't take only the words that they are saying. But I go into what the, what, um, the the state government have said about that and what they has been published. So I integrate that. Um, so, and then I, I mentioned all the emotional environment facts and then collecting the data about uh, if they are going to leave, like if the US citizen is going to leave parents who are ill, provide that evidence because that's something that immigration would like to uh, probably con count into consideration when granting their petition. And then I try to get information not only for the, like I said, for the client, but um, if, the, if the child has an IP, I want to see the IP. If, if they are saying this, I want to see it. If not, then I just have to say that they mentioned they did, but I didn't see that physically. Um, I try to know as much as possible about the country origin. origin. If I don't know, I, I, I consult with someone who knows. Um, sometimes, um, and then sometimes uh, we don't. I mean, I know, I, I because I have read and I know the context of the political. But, but things have been changing. Things are new, and I need to continue um, learning, reading, and getting consultants for me to um, to incorporate that in my report. Again, minimize or exa exaggeration. I do it when I administer the objective data, so I can talk about that and then the consistency of their story uh, with me and with the attorney. I tell them the limits of confidentiality the first time I see them. I have a form that says that this is going to immigration and uh, whatever you are saying to me is going to be included in the report. So, so if you don't want me to do that, then don't say it, right? So basically, I'm very clear about that, okay. Practice pointers, just to conclude, uh, remember, you have to ask the, re the relief that they're applying for. Remember that you have to know the evidentiary threshold, how much evidence you are seeking. Which agency are you presenting the report? Which agency is going to be reading about um, the evidence? Country, uh, the client's country conditions, you also have to, uh, to, you have to be mindful of that. 
to incorporate it into the report. Any questions? Comments, additions? Mm -hmm. Can I just get one very quick comment that uh, overall I thought you gave a great presentation. The problem is that it's too short. You know, yeah. the, the time that we have. I know, yeah. This is a workshop, like, yeah. And they, they, I was asking if, if I could put in a post, and I'm like, <laughs> no, in a post, I will not capture everything, right? So thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.